All right, welcome to the first session of the third EPA forum. We're talking today in this session about MS4 planning. I'll start off to begin with, uh, I'm sure most of you probably heard it in the opening session, but just in case, I'll uh, reiterate it again that you'll be hearing a number of presentations throughout the next few days that and this information is offered as part of the MS forum are the views and experiences of the organizations presenting the EPA and Pennsylvania DEP do not endorse any one approach or funding strategy. The views and the opinions expressed by the speakers and the speakers organizations are their own and do not reflect those of the EPA or Pennsylvania DEP. Many mention of any commercial enterprise product or publication does not indicate an EPA or Pennsylvania DEP endorsement. You'll be hearing that for a few times today. I uh, also want to say that we are grateful that you took time to attend and participate in this forum, uh, and particularly to our speakers. The, this event has been developed to focus on those permittees' experiences as they work to meet the conditions of the Pennsylvania MS4 permit. All of the presenters today have volunteered to share their this information and their experiences as a learning opportunity for fellow permittees and local decision makers, and we are grateful for them sharing their time. So our speaker today in this session is Dr. Lauren McPhillips. She's a professor at Penn State University. She's going to talk to us a little bit about green infrastructure and extreme events. And Dr. McPhillips, I'm sure that introduction did not do you anywhere near the justice you deserve, so feel free to tell us a little bit more about yourself if you like. No problem, and thank you for having me here. So um, I've been at Penn State for a few years now. I have a bit of a, a hybrid background. Um, I was actually trained as a hydrologist and then kind of made my way into urban systems and, and ecological engineering a little bit more. Um, and this question of how um, green infrastructure uh, might play a role in extreme event management and, and considerations related to climate change has been something that has been growing in importance and I've become, um, it, it's become a topic of interest uh, to me, something I've just started kind of getting into. And so my goal today is to provide um, kind of a synthesis of some decision relevant information, some food for thought, hopefully spur some discussion and hear from you guys some, you know, some of your concerns or questions around these topics. So, um, you know, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but just kind of reminding us where we are in Pennsylvania in terms of, you know, what we're um, designing for, uh, you know, the, the size of events. We're largely thinking about nuisance events, these sort of events that are important for first flush uh, water quality concerns, you know, the, the two year, 24 hour sort of event. Um, when we think about peak flow rate control, we're thinking about larger, um, less frequent events. But um, for the most part, for runoff reduction and, and um, you know, volume reduction, we're really focused on these more frequent, smaller magnitude sort of events. So how does Pennsylvania compare here, you know, to other places? So in a previous um, project I worked on, we were working across a lot of different cities across the U.S. and around the world. And, and um, you know, cities are in different places in terms of their, their embracing of green stormwater infrastructure as part of their stormwater management portfolio. And, um, you know, we were curious, um, thinking about, um, you know, the role of green infrastructure in extreme events. What are cities really requiring in terms of their, um, you know, design storms for uh, green infrastructure. And so um, there's different cities shown here in some different, um, you know, t colors and types of symbols. And then the triangle represents the requirement related to runoff volume reduction. So you can see that, you know, if you look at the triangles, a lot of cities are down around this are you know the same place as what we are these focused on these nuisance events largely focused on capturing that sort of first flush um phoenix arizona where i previously used to live um, is kind of the odd one out they get these really uh they don't have a lot of precipitation annually but they get these really intense events and so to manage flash flooding they actually require management of the 100 year, two hour event. So that's, they're a little bit unique in that way. For uh, peak flow management, you can see that kind of skews a little bit towards um, 
you know, larger return periods requiring, you know, management of peak flows to, um, you know, pre-development standards up to, you know, some of these, these, you know, 25 year, 100 year return periods. So thinking about what climate change means in Pennsylvania and, and what we might expect in terms of more extreme events, um, you know, uh, I'm not going to throw out an exact definition for extreme, um, but, you know, we probably all have the sense, right, that we're talking about these, these least, um, these least frequent um, events, these larger magnitude, higher intensity events that, you know, we, we might be thinking around like a hundred year return period or maybe like a 95 to 99th percentile sort of event. But, you know, uh, everybody has a slightly different definition of what extreme really means. But we're talking about these big ones that cause a lot of a lot of issues, um, a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of cost and, and potentially, um, you know, hazards to human health. So in, in Pennsylvania, I don't know if you guys have, have heard about this, but there's a hot off the presses, a new climate impacts assessment for our state that came out last month, has some really nice graphics and uh, synthesis of different stats for our state um, in terms of flooding, but also things like extreme heat, which I won't talk about today, but is of course also a concern um, in which green infrastructure may also play a role. So we're um, you know, projecting statewide that um, there'll be around an 11% increase in our annual precipitation. So we already get a decent amount of rain and you know, it's looking like we'll get um, you know, several inches more per year. And um, you know, we see some changes in some of these other sorts of metrics as well. If we look at the annual maximum three-day precipitation, that's projected to increase by around 16%. These changes, of course, vary across the state. You know, we have variation in our annual precipitation across the state. And so um, if we look at it spatially here, this is the number of days with very heavy precipitation going from observed patterns on the top left down to, you know, 80 to 100 years from now on the bottom right. And so you see, especially towards the southeast and eastern side of Pennsylvania, we see more of these dark blue colors showing up, which means indicates more days expected with very heavy precipitation. So it is something that we need to think about in terms of how we how we can better manage some of these larger sort of precipitation events. Um, you know, we're thinking about design too, we need to be thinking about should we be updating our design standards? I would argue, yes, our problem is right now, I, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what the right um, approach is for taking, you know, downscaled information from all these climate models and turning that into, um, you know, relevant updates to our design standards. So we're talking about updates to our depth duration frequency or our intensity duration frequency curves that we use to figure out what that, you know, two year, 24 hour storm actually is. Um, you know, you, you may uh, get your information from different sources like the NOAA Atlas 14 or, um, you know, some of these other sources that are largely levering historical data, but we need ways to, um, you know, update this information such that we're um, representing these patterns that we anticipate in the next 100 years. And, um, you know, this question came up when I gave this talk to a, another um, MS forum, forum last month about, you know, who should be responsible for this? And I think that's a, an important question. There's certainly some of us in the academic realm working on it, but, you know, for this to be the design standard that is then you know, implemented on the ground, um, you know, it needs to be coming, uh, we need more leadership from our from our government agencies on this. And I know some of our professional societies are thinking about this as well. So back to what's shown on this slide, um, some of my colleagues in Carnegie Mellon have been working on some different methods for, um, you know, what some of these best processes are for taking, you know, what's represented in these global climate models and getting that down to um, updated IDF or, or DDF curves. And so what's shown on this map, there's a lot going on here, but they, they selected a bunch of cities across the U.S. 
and um, looked at the changes to the, what's shown here is the 25 year return period storm. And the blue triangle shows the one hour duration and the purple shows the 24 hour duration. And the size represents the expected change in that event from, you know, kind of current observed to what's anticipated um, in, the, in the future, like at the end of the coming century. And so we see, um, you know, Pennsylvania, we have Pittsburgh represented there, and then, you know, New York and Baltimore are obviously um, not too far away. Um, you know, Pittsburgh in particular is anticipating, um, you know, 25 to 50% increases, and, you know, Baltimore and New York are showing as, as increases as well, a little bit smaller. Um, so zooming into uh, Pittsburgh, and unfortunately, you know, because these folks doing this were based in in, in Pittsburgh, and um, uh, this is this is the good example I had to show for this. But it's you know it's similar to what's expected on the eastern part of the state as well. But what we see here is more of the the you know looking into the curve across all these return periods, some of these expected changes according to um, you know, uh, using climate models to look at the future. So we see the dotted curve on the bottom is observed, and then we see a couple different methods that were used here to, um, you know, take the information from the climate models and develop the um, updates to these um, design storms. And so in general, you see that the depth of rain is increasing. On the left is a one hour duration event, on the right is a 24 hour duration event. So no matter which of those methods you pick, there is you know, an increase and we see uh, more of an increase at these higher return periods, but also higher uncertainty. And I think this is a reason why, why we haven't seen um, you know, uh, information come out on, on updated um, design, uh, you know, updated design standards yet because there's still kind of discussion about, you know, which is the best approach to take in some of these different ways of dealing with um, the, uh, you know, the statistics and the and the uncertainty and best representing that. So, you know, what do we do here? It's it's clear that we're anticipating increases um, in in precipitation, you know, across different duration sort of events. Um, you know, but designing for higher capacities costs money, right? We all we all know this. If you look in the BMP manual, there's this um, statement in there that you know it's just we don't design to the 100 year storm for runoff reduction because that's just not practical economically. We don't see that event very often. You know, it's inherent in the statistics behind it, and so it's just not. Um, it just doesn't make sense to design everything to that capacity necessarily, but we also can't ignore the fact that we will be seeing larger, more intense and more impactful precipitation events. So, you know, there's two things here, thinking about the design standard that we have, what, you know, uh, a certain return period storm means, but also thinking about the fact that we're seeing, you know, changes in these different sort of, you know, large extreme events and and how can we also um you know beyond updating the design standard how can we sort of think more broadly about um ways to sort of um uh manage these larger events without necessarily designing everything to you know a 100 year capacity so i'm going to kind of switch now to thinking about you know some some um potential solutions and kind of just seeding some ideas here so I want to talk about a, a couple different concepts that I think are really useful as, you know, you all are planning and thinking about, um, you know, opportunities in your municipality in the future for, um, you know, creating resilience to a wide range of stormwater events. So things that I'll talk about in the next few minutes are, you know, concepts like multifunctionality, which of course is a big reason that we're all excited about green stormwater infrastructure, the idea that we can help manage water quantity and quality, but also potentially provide some, uh, you know, heat reduction, aesthetics, improvement, habitat, um, recreation. We'll talk about the, um, you know, whether we should be thinking, uh, you know, where it's appropriate to think about more centralized solutions versus more distributed solutions. Um, the concepts of, you know, redundancy, you know, having, you know, a bunch of one type versus 
diversity or different sorts of types of stormwater controls. And this concept of safe to fail. I know that the word failure just makes every engineer like, oh, I don't, I don't want to hear that word. We're supposed to design to not have things fail. But, um, you know, the, this, this concept is really about thinking about where are areas in the landscape that we're okay to have flood, where in this case, something flooding equals failure. So when we think about these extreme events, thinking about these portions of the landscape that are safe to fail, quote unquote. And I'll, I'll give more examples and talk more about that momentarily. So this idea of multifunctionality, just to throw some actual examples out there. So I mentioned, I used to live in the Phoenix metropolitan area where they have these really intense uh, summer monsoon sort of storm events. And so they need to think about managing these extreme events and, and they have already built that into their plans. And so in addition to actually requiring new development to design to the 100 year two hour event, they have a lot of sports and recreation fields. And this is an example on the left there from Tempe, Arizona, where the recreation field is actually designed as an overflow basin. And so in this case, you know, it's 99% of the time it's functioning as a sports field and then it's acting to manage the overflow from some of these larger uh, stormwater events when needed. And there's obviously some, you know, social considerations there where, you know, you need to educate people and do outreach and have signage about the fact that it's intended for this field to flood during storm events and, you know, that people cannot recreate there at that time. But, you know, it's kind of become ingrained in, um, you know, how how things are there and people understand that that's the case. Um, on the on the right is just an, another example from over in Europe where you have a basketball court in a public square that are also serving uh, for stormwater detention at certain times. This is an example from State College here in central Pennsylvania, where I'm uh, based, where, um, you know, we're here we're thinking about, you know, along the stream itself and making room to flood. Um, in this case, there um, uh, has been a park created around this urban stream that is super flashy. And then a constructed uh, floodplain wetland was also added in there for some additional uh, mitigation of some of these peak flows and also water quality management as well. And so in this case, it's, you know, it's it's obviously hard to do this when there's already development up against a stream. Um, but where we can create room for, you know, our streams to actually be able to flood and actually be able to use the floodplain. And in this case, you know, have that be a park and, you know, really well used recreation space most of the time. Um, it's, you know, it provides a lot of um, a lot of multifunctionality and allows the stream to attenuate, you know, its flows in the way that it naturally wants to. So this concept of safe to fail. This also goes really tightly along with the multifunctionality. Um, you know, those examples are also examples of safe to fail and that, you know, they serve for recreation most of the time, but then it's okay to have them flood. Um, you know, it's it, it is as long as, you know, people are aware that that is, you know, an intended purpose and, you know, no one, you know, is going to get injured or hurt. There's going to be no, um, uh, you know, major loss of resources when those things are flooding for a few days of the year. And so it's the idea of having infrastructure that is okay to flood in more extreme events. And so instead of focusing on just inherently preventing any flooding at all, the focus is on, you know, how can we strategically have these sort of features that can help minimize the consequences of the extreme event, focusing on solutions that, again, are multifunctional and can help maintain you know, other sort of social and ecosystem services. And, you know, really inherent in this too is the the necessity in reaching across disciplinary boundaries, obviously in thinking about the, the planning logistics of where are the best locations for these sorts of things. Often it might, you know, involve working with your, you know, parks department and thinking strategically about these sort of opportunities. So one example that I think is nice to share um, is from New York City. And obviously New York is a huge city with lots of financial resources, but um, 
you know, I think the, there's some lessons learned here that are valuable at, you know, at, at many scales. And um, so what I'm going to just talk about for a few minutes here is this effort that they've embarked on that they call uh, cloudburst planning. So cloudburst is the idea of these really intense uh, sort of storm events, you know, a lot of rain in a short period of time. And how do we really minimize the, the flooding impacts from this? And so they um, embarked on a um, a resiliency planning study with Ramble um, in, in partnership with the, the DEP. And they were really interested specifically in the role of blue-green infrastructure related to managing these high-intensity cloudburst events. So BGI you see there is just blue-green infrastructure, a term they like to use. So then, you know, the second graphic there in the middle is thinking about, you know, Normally, a lot of their stormwater infrastructure is designed to the five-year return period, but in this case, they're really thinking about what are ways that we can um, better manage these more extreme events like the 100-year sort of event. And then finally, how in this you know, planning exercise, how can they think about ways to increase cooperation between city agencies and stakeholders? So in this case, they were thinking about parks, transportation, housing authority, you know, really thinking about who is benefiting and also um, their their DEP. And I encourage you if you, you know, um, want to hear more about this, they have a really nice executive summary of this planning effort available online with a lot of really nice graphics. So just just a few things pulled out of there. Um, so the sort of strategies that they're thinking about um are you know it, it's a whole mix of strategies from kind of you know on the bottom uh the 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 uh, middle bottom there the cloudburst pipe kind of you know just upsizing you know your standard storm storm sewer pipes where that's you know you just need to convey the water out of there but then also thinking a lot about these um pairing with these different blue green infrastructure strategies like you know increased local retention um um, as well as, you know, designing streets with infiltration trenches and street trees. Also designing what they call cloudburst roads, where some of the roads are intentionally designed to convey water on the road itself. And again, this requires, you know, outreach and education to make that happen. But um, the idea that during a small time of the year, um, and, and this is actually the case in, in parts of the Phoenix region as well, they actually, you know, have roads, certain roads that are intentionally designed to convey stormwater in these larger events. And then on the right, you know, they're, you know, thinking strategically about some areas of the city that have been, you know, prone to some of these, um, you know, to some of these uh, flooding nuisance impacts from some of these larger events and where strategically, you know, how to connect these different features um, and, you know, where might make most sense to put some of them in the sort of mix of these different sorts of features. So they did a whole cost benefit analysis on this. Obviously, you know, it, it requires a lot of funds up front to put in, you know, to upsize pipes and to put in the add in these different sorts of blue green infrastructure. But they found a net benefit still due to the avoided costs. It's always hard to convince people, you know, that, you know, you'll avoid costs in the future. But there are substantial avoided costs from, you know, minimizing those um, other disruptions by having, you know, much less extensive flooding and the added multifunctionality from these features, um, you know, also was considered in this cost benefit analysis. So I just want to talk a little bit too about, you know, what do we actually know about how different sorts of green infrastructure function during extreme events. So um, I'll talk about a couple examples at the facility scale, but also at the uh, whole watershed scale. So at the individual facility scale, you know, in these cases, it was you know, it's hard to intentionally monitor an extreme event <laughs> unless you run out there and, you know, get some 
sensors in and, and collect some data. But in these in these cases, these were long term studies where they just kind of lucked out to hap happen to capture a large event like um, Hurricane Irene or Superstorm Sandy and happened to see how the facilities reacted in those cases relative to other uh, smaller magnitude events. So uh, one example is a bioinfiltration swale in New York City. You, you may be familiar with the fact that New York, as part of their um, combined sewer overflow consent decree, has been putting in a lot of these small um, bioinfiltration swales, whatever you would like to call them, rain gardens. Um, and in this case, uh, one observation they made was that there were challenges with the water actually even entering the facility efficiently during extreme events. So they found um, that, that extreme events bypassed the inlet a lot more often, 40% versus 23% bypass in smaller non-extreme events. So a consideration in terms of how we might better design inlets to actually get the stormwater into the facility that's supposed to be controlling it. And then um, in this case, even though they were monitoring over, you know, um, close to 100 different events, there was only one time when they actually measured overflow, and that was during Hurricane Irene. They had no measured overflow in um, 14 other extreme events and 78 other smaller magnitude events. The other example um, that's nice to show comes from Philadelphia, a monitoring of an infiltration trench. And in this case, um, you know, this is designed to, uh, you know, typical Pennsylvania standards. So, you know, mostly designed to be managing these smaller nuisance events. And in this case, 20 of 159 events produced overflow with 89% um, of these events being greater than the design storm. Um, the overflow was really brief periods, so 97 to 99% of the runoff was still retained in Superstorm Sandy, and 93% of runoff was retained for all events exceeding the design storm. So why, you know, why are they seemingly performing better than what they were designed for? In this case, the really critical aspect is that these are facilities that are designed to infiltrate, and so this is where the ability to infiltrate and retain is really critical versus just detention based facilities. And, and of course, this is another reason why people are, um, you know, embracing green infrastructure. And that's a, a key part of most green infrastructure design is is having the ability to infiltrate um, and and inherent in infiltration is the ability to continuously convey the water down, right? And when we're designing, we're largely thinking about surface storage capacity, but this ability to continuously convey water during a long storm event can really help to manage even, you know, an event that is on paper larger than what you are designed to be able to manage. Just a little bit of an example from the watershed scale. So it's there's not a lot of evidence at the watershed scale out there because it's you know it's it's challenging to actually have watersheds that are comparable enough in um, certain aspects you know but have different sorts of uh, stormwater controls in them. But in this case, um, the USGS um, was able to work with. Um, some municipalities in um, in Maryland as well as in Virginia, and they um, monitored for um, quite a while um, four watersheds where one was a nice control forested watershed. That's the top left bright green uh, watershed there, and then three are more urbanized. And so you see one labeled DIST MD. That's um, a Maryland watershed that was you know fairly urbanized but had um, a diverse range of distributed green infrastructure around that watershed. So rain barrels, infiltration trenches, rain gardens, um, um, you know, over a over hundred, I think. The centralized um, watershed there, Cent MD, is, um, you know, similar amount of urban development, but in this case, they had a smaller number of stormwater controls and they were mostly just larger centralized detention pond sort of features. The fourth watershed there, Cent VA, that one's in uh, Virginia, but still kind of similar, you know, geology and sort of landscape characteristics. The difference there, so even though they had centralized stormwater management, 
they had a different sort of pattern of urban development. So this is a really important point that, you know, it's not just about our structural stormwater controls, BMPs, whatever you would like to call them, um, but it's also thinking about the LID side, the low impact development and how we actually organize development. And we see actually in the data that that plays a really big role as well, because of course, by preserving, you know, you can see that there's sort of those green corridors preserved around the streams where you're protecting that floodplain, but you're also protecting intact, you know, undeveloped land that again has that ability to infiltrate a lot of water. So you get to the right here and you see um, this is during Hurricane uh, Irene slash Tropical Storm Lee in 2011. Um, you see a couple different examples of different sort of hydrologic indicators from this study across these four watersheds. And so the things I want to point out are that um, the um, centralized, um, uh, the, the Virginia catchment with, um, you know, strategically planned urban development actually, um, you know, was pretty much comparable to the forested catchment. So you know, just strategically planning where the development is and protecting those floodplains and, and intact natural space went a really far way. But also the um, the uh, Maryland watershed with distributed green infrastructure um, also did pretty well. The worst was the urbanized watershed with just centralized, you know, large detention ponds. So in this case, we see the difference of having, you know, either um, a diverse mix of distributed green infrastructure or having, um, you know, strategically placed development and low impact development practices. So a few concluding points here. So, you know, it's clear when we look at the information coming out of climate models that we need to consider updated depth duration frequency and intensin intensity duration um, frequency curves um, and, and update, update those design guidelines. And obviously, um, you know, this is something where we, we um, need some um, leadership on this to, um, you know, to, to, to enable these updates. Um, a diverse mix of strategies distributed around the watershed helps, um, you know, create this buffer and and, you know, we see at the watershed scale that we have, you know, improved performance by having a wide range of strategies, you know, um, distributed around the watershed. Having infiltration based green stormwater infrastructure really helps sustain performance in larger events. And finally, there's really a need to think um, strategically in future land planning to find ways to identify these safe to fail features in the landscape that we can leverage in, in larger sort of events. So with that, that's all that I wanted to say. Hopefully you found something useful in there, but I would, you know, love to hear questions or, you know, um, examples of, you know, things you see as major barriers and hurdles related to managing extreme events. Okay, thank you, Dr. McPhillips. So we do have quite a bit, about 10 minutes for questions. So if you have a question for Dr. McPhillips, please feel free to put that in the chat. Or if you like, uh, this time you could, you can unmute. Um, would like, if you would please raise your hand. If you have a question you'd like to ask directly. Okay, uh, I have a couple. So. Um, we've done a little bit of research like this. Actually, you mentioned the, I'm giving a, or my presentation will be tomorrow, where we looked for the for the EPA at the BMP implementation strategies that are the most resilient. And I think we've also found that the combination of distributed and centralized BMPs is is the most resilient. But I guess one question you mentioned on on how well they perform. There's been some discussion I've heard about possibility that we're actually over designing some of our green stormwater infrastructure and then seeing how well they perform in some of these larger events. Just wondering if you had a thought about that. Um, I, I mean, I, I feel like, 
were still, you know, they, they performed better than they were designed to. But I think in this case, um, you know, if it's economically feasible to continue putting in strategies of that size, like we were still getting even some flooding in larger events for those features. And so I feel like it's there's not a reason for, you know, reducing the the design standard for some of these features. I still feel like um, uh, that, you know, if anything, we need to be thinking about strategic ways for managing, you know, larger magnitude events in, in certain parts of the watershed in, um, you know, these sort of multifunctional sort of means. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. McPhillips? Okay. Um, so I have another question. You also mentioned in the that a lot of the flows were bypassing the distributed practices. It sounded like it looked like particularly in, in New York, but I also know in Philadelphia, they're, they're looking at redesigning their trench drains for diverting the flow from the street into bioretention areas. Have you looked at what would be an effective inlet? I mean, I've, the, the systems perform well, and I think I, I do agree with you. I, I, oversized maybe isn't the right term that I think a lot of it is that they are they do performed better than we anticipated and I know we're, we're working on that as far as advancing the strategies that we use for modeling and sizing the BMPs but I definitely agree that it's probably more of that they're performing better than we anticipated not that we're necessarily oversizing them so from that standpoint obviously if we can't get the water into the the practices it doesn't really do any good for them to be performing well so have you looked at strategies for on inlets or sizing design standards or details for sizing inlets yeah um i unfortunately haven't done much work in that area it sounds like you may you may be more familiar with you know specific potential changes in the inlet design i would say i've been you know in i'm doing some work in lancaster pennsylvania and you know what i've been learning from them thinking a lot more about the water quality side and sort of the efficiency of maintenance that's also obviously interacts with you know the ability to continue to get water efficiently into the practice you know they're really thinking about how can we design the um, inlet region too to be able to maximize our ability to easily clean out that sediment that's accumulating and so i think there's a lot of different sorts of opportunities you know to to continue to improve our our um, inlet designs i see there's a few other questions coming in here um, I see one about, you know, what's really different about cloudburst planning versus climate resiliency planning. And that's an excellent one that actually came up in the last forum as well. And so what I see as the difference here is cloudburst is really focused on these high intensity, truly extreme events and, and really focused just on precipitation. In my mind, climate resiliency planning is encompasses that, but is much broader. It's thinking about, you know, the full range of sorts of precipitation changes we might see, but also the other sort of climate related changes. And of course, heat and temperatures is a really big one. You know, there's like, it's actually kind of scary, the projections in the Pennsylvania um, climate impacts assessment related to heat. And so in, you know, in our urban core where there is, you know, a lot of impervious surface, we need to think about what's also going to help with the, the heat issue. And this is something of interest to me is understanding the co-benefits of um, different sorts of green infrastructure related to also um, sort of microclimate regulation and heat mitigation as well. I think that's another really important element. Something that I think is, um, you know, from what we see from the climate models, probably a little bit less of concern in Pennsylvania is, is drought. You know, we need to be thinking about um, plants in our green infrastructure that, you know, are, are resilient to a range of conditions. Um, uh, road salt also being another thing that kind of interacts with changes in, in winter weather associated with climate change. That kind of is a stressor on top of plants, but I don't want to go off on too many 
too many tangents here. Climate resiliency planning, I would say, is kind of a uh, broader, um, like big picture of, of all the different sorts of impacts of many different types that we need to be thinking about. Um, any ongoing Pennsylvania effort, effort to update the precipitation guidelines? Um, to be honest, um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm still somewhat new to Pennsylvania and trying to, you know, get in on everything going on. As far as I hear, um, um, you know, there's there's some discussions, but I'm not aware of anything, um, you know, formal, well in progress yet. I don't know if Jason has better insight, but I have heard that, you know, some of our professional societies related to stormwater management, like the American Society of Civil Engineers, Environmental and Water Resources Institute has a lot of, you know, committees thinking about some of these questions on, you know, a national scale, but at the state level, um, I'm less certain about um, what our what our what our state of things is, um, and and something I'm trying to get a better handle on. You know, here at Penn State, we're trying to figure out how we can play a role in you know serving our state and our municipalities. But you know, the design standards inherently need to come you know from from the state, and so um, we're 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 trying to understand how we could you know help or play a part with. Um, with this, but I guess that's my long-winded answer of, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure yet. Yeah, I, I'm going to add to that a little bit. I mean, I don't know about specifically in Pennsylvania, but I know there are definitely efforts going ar on around in the region to update the IDF curves, and then NOAA is pretty regularly updating their their data, their precipitation databases, so I know we're, we're all using NOAA Atlas 14 for the most part, and I, but I do know that there are some updates in the works to include the latest data, and that's where you know, in the last two to three years, we're definitely seeing some changes in our precipitation patterns. Um, and so the, there are definitely efforts to, to update those databases, uh, but I think, you know, as far as a, as a group, we've, Tetra Tech has worked with a few areas in Michigan with a couple of municipalities and we're working now with the EPA and the Chesapeake Bay Trust to develop and update IDF curves that the municipalities for different regions will, will definitely have access to. So I know that some of those efforts are, are definitely ongoing. And so, but then there's there's also the debate on what is the best strategy for designing a BMP? Is are we using IDF curves and the precipitation, or are we using more continuous simulation? models to size the the BMPs. So I think um, the depending on which side we fall on that, I think both are, are being updated as well. So we're updating the IDF, the IDF curves, but we're also they're updating the the databases that we're using to get our long term precipitation data that we then use in the continuous simulation models that we're using to size the BMPs. Yeah, I think, you know, the the challenge with NOAA is like, you know, they're, they are incorporating newer data. And as you pointed out, like we're already seeing some impacts, but, you know, we also need that next step of actually, you know, incorporating the future projections as well. Definitely. Okay, we have time for at least one more question. Are there any others? That, I think that was an interesting point you made about the road salt. Is, do you know, are you looking into, or are there any other, or you know of any other efforts that would consider some of the other impacts for our changing climate? If we're, like I said, if we're getting a lot more snow. I think your, your point about now using more road salt and accounting for that in the design, have, are there any other considerations that you've thought about or looked into that we should account for in designing? BMPs. Yeah, I mean, just you know, the uh, there's there's multiple potential stressors on plants, right? And so the ro road salt is one. Um, heat or drought is another one. And so I think this is kind of an evolving and um, adaptive management kind of thing that's happening, right? In terms of um, what's the best 
plant palette, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on going native, but again, drawing from um, my knowledge from what Lancaster has been doing, you know, they tried to go with like native to their area, but realize those plants are not tolerant to salt at all. So then you can, you know, think sort of similar climate region and, and other sort of similar characteristics, but move towards the coast and look for plants that are um, native to the broader region, but are more tolerant to, to salt impacts. And, you know, there's, there's kind of ways to, you know, think strategically about, um, uh, you know, some of those choices. It, may not always be the case that the plants precisely native to your region may be the best for you know the the green stormwater infrastructure given some of the unique mix of stressors that they're dealing with and i have some colleagues here in um, landscape contracting and, and um, landscape architecture or architecture that are thinking a lot about you know trying to improve some of these um, plant palette recommendations okay excellent well, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of our session. So thank you again, Dr. McPhillips. It was a, a great presentation and a good Q&A session. So I think it's now, just like the other session, we can. it's best to leave this session and go back to the agenda and click on the link there. And we will begin. The next session will be BMP case studies, and we'll have an introduction at 9.45. So again, it's best to leave this meeting and then click on the link there to enter the introductory section for BNPK studies.